All right, this video is going to be a different kind of video from my usual content. Uh, there's a lot of presidential tier lists on YouTube, and I figured, hey, why not make my own? Even though I'm not a historian, I'm not a history major, I don't have a huge interest in history, and I'm not super knowledgeable on it. So consider this tier list a layman's presidential tier list. Um, I'm going to be referencing my extensive research, which comprised of Googling each of them for about 10 minutes and making notes on them, and just my own personal knowledge uh, that any pre-existing knowledge I may have from them from beforehand. So, uh, this is going to be a long one, so uh, I'll just get started by saying I'm going to rank them based on uh, not necessarily how much they got done in office, but the quality of their decisions while they were in office, and whether or not uh, those decisions had a positive or negative long-term effect on the country. So with that, we'll start with Wash Georgington, um, who was a very self-aware, humble, pragmatic guy. He was actually hesitant to take on the role of president, but he was kind of peer pressured into it. And many believe that's what made him a great leader. The fact that he didn't really want to be a leader made him not abuse his power. And for that reason, George Washington is considered a great president, not necessarily because of what he did, but because of what he didn't do. He famously voluntarily stepped down after two terms um, he insisted on being called Mr. President, um, instead of your highness or your honor or, uh, your kinship or whatever titles they had back then. He warned against the creation of political parties, uh, which of course John Adams and Thomas Jefferson immediately disobeyed him on after he went out of office. But still, he had that foresight, which I think was very important. And had they heeded his warning, uh, our country would be in a better place today. Um, and the thing with George Washington, and he did this when he was a general too, was he wasn't necessarily the greatest general or the greatest leader by himself, but he knew to surround himself with smart people who, uh, so that way he could get a diversified uh, set of inputs and make better formed decisions uh, based on what they all had to say. I have written down here that uh, he famously had uh, fake teeth that were not wood, but hippo bone and, uh, teeth extracted from his slaves. Um, he, apparently the reason he needed fake teeth was because he liked cracking nuts with his teeth. And by the time he became president, he only had one natural tooth left. Um, I know dentistry wasn't what it is today, but Come on, man, if you're cracking nuts and destroying your teeth, you'd think you would stop cracking nuts and start using a nutcracker, but, uh, okay. Uh, I know it seems like George Washington gets a lot of credit for setting the precedent for being the president, but, uh... You gotta hand it to him. He had the opportunity to be king and he turned it down because he knew uh, it wasn't for him or it wouldn't be best for the country. And because he always did what he thought was best for the country, uh, I gotta give him S tier, just like everyone else. Uh, next we have John Adams. 
he uh, was a very important founding father. Uh, he had a great life filled with a lot of notable accomplishments. Um, unfortunately, his presidency wasn't one of the high points of his life. He was uh, a short, arrogant little man. Um, apparently, he was very intelligent, but socially awkward. And some, I forget if it's him or Thomas Jefferson, that some believe he may have had undiagnosed autism or Asperger's. And in that regard, uh, John Adams was like the Sheldon Cooper of his time. The thing with John Adams is he spent his whole life being a founding father, campaigning for uh, a limited centralized government and freedom and junk. And then what does he do when he get, becomes the president? He uh, speaks out against journalists uh, and other people speaking out against him. Uh, and he wants them thrown in jail, but I don't think he actually did. Uh, he signed the Alien and Sedition Acts, uh, which infringed on civil rights and deported people and made it harder to become a citizen, basically. Um, many of those laws actually still stand, albeit they have been heavily, heavily modified over the years several times. Uh, some people give John Adams credit for not owning slaves, but you gotta keep in mind he lived in Massachusetts, where the soil there is very poor and rocky and not suitable for farming. Like, what use would he have for slaves there? So, uh, because I feel like he did more bad than good, but he didn't royally screw anything up, I'm going to give him D tier. Going from someone with no slaves to someone who owned a lot of slaves uh, is T.J. Thomas Jefferson. If we were ranking these people uh, based on their whole lives or based on them as human beings, this would be a very different list because uh, Thomas Jefferson wasn't really a great morally upstanding guy, but I do think he was a good president. Um, he is famous for the Louisiana Purchase, which doubled the size of our nation, which at the time was kind of a strange decision. Um, basically, uh, France was willing to do it because they wanted money at the time because of all the Napoleonic Wars going on at the time and the revolutions and stuff. Um, but uh, it was kind of a strange decision because Thomas Jefferson was a big limited government guy and John Adams was the centralized government guy and it would be weird for the limited government guy to just make this huge decision to double the size of the country and buy everything from Louisiana to Montana. He uh, pardoned people prosecuted under the Alien and Sedition Acts, which were introduced by John Adams. So uh, it's good to know he was against that. Just, uh, uh, also, despite being more libertarian standing uh, and more pro-states rights, the army grew under him and founded West Point during his time in office. Um, as far as negatives go, there was the Embargo Act, which was kind of dumb, uh, but it was later repealed. Um, overall, just, just for the Louisiana Purchase alone and the uh, fact that that was a big asset for the United States moving forward... Uh, I'll give Thomas Jefferson A tier. Next, we have James Madison, uh, who famously drafted the Bill of Rights, but that was before his presidency. Um, during his presidency, 
Uh, I think he was a bit reckless getting us involved in the War of 1812. Uh, a lot of people say the War of 1812 started over the conscri conscription of sailors, but uh, you got to keep in mind at the time the United States also wanted to invade Canada, and that was another motivating force behind getting into the War of 1812, and the United States was not really prepared to fight a war against the b biggest empire in the world at the time, the British. Um, uh, the White House got burned down because of that, uh, though to be fair, that was in retaliation for uh, the United States burning down the Canadian capital first. Um, I mean, he was a bit reckless getting us involved in the War of 1812, but other than that, I feel like his leadership during that time was decent, and he didn't really uh, seem to screw up anything too badly, so I'll put him in C tier. Next, we have James Monroe, our final founding father president. I'm going to give him a B, uh, even though I don't really have a whole lot to say about him. His presidency uh, was a good, peaceful time for the country. Uh, he had a nice, balanced cabinet. Uh, things were just generally going great in America, and it's called the era of good feelings. And hey, if you're, if you're presiding over an era of a country's history called the era of good feelings, you must be doing something right. And uh, just so you guys know, some of these guys I'm going to have almost nothing to say about. Some of them uh, I'll have a lot to say about, uh, especially once we get to the more modern and recent presidents. Uh, but some of these guys I'm just kind of going to glaze over. So I apologize for that in advance. Next, we have John Quincy Adams, John Adams' son. Uh, he was, uh, he had a lot of potential. Uh, he was a great diplomat, uh, spent most of his life uh, in the role of a diplomat. Uh, he was an extremely intelligent guy. Uh, like, I mean, you can say that about a lot of the guys on this list, but he was a literal genius like his s they didn't have iq tests back then but his estimated iq was 168 and for reference uh 160 i think is what is needed to count as genius level iq so this guy was a literal genius insanely smart dude so he was very qualified um as far as his presidency goes, uh, I don't think it's one of the high points of his career. Um, a lot of infrastructure projects were started, like canals, during his tenure. So I guess that counts for something. Um, I don't really know much about him other than he liked to swim in the Potomac River naked. And one time someone stole his clothes and he had to ask someone to get more from the White House. And that reminds me, his dad, John Adams, was the first president uh, to stay in the White House, even though it wasn't called the White House then. Um, but yeah, I'll put him in C tier just because... He seemed decent, uh, didn't seem to do anything extraordinary, but didn't do anything necessarily bad either. Next, uh, we have an interesting one, Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson was an insane person. He was a professional, badass motherfucker. He was... Not only a general in the War of 1812, he dueled people, and one of the duels he got shot, and the bullet missed his heart by half an inch, and because it was too close to his heart to operate, he just lived the rest of his life with a bullet in his chest. 
And one time someone tried to assassinate him, but the gun misfired and he just beat the man with his cane for it. So this guy just like was crazy. And uh, a one thing a lot of people like about Andrew Jackson is that he's our first president of humble origins. Um, he grew up poor and rose through the ranks to become a leader. And a lot of people find him inspiring because of that. Uh, he and, and uh, John Quincy Adams famously hated each other because uh, John Quincy Adams thought he was uh, an illiterate, dumb person. And uh, Andrew Jackson hated him for the opposite reason. He was the first president to ride a train during his presidency. Um, to my knowledge, John Quincy Adams rode a train in 1833, but that was after he became president. Um, I mean, after his presidency ended. And it also another thing I forgot to mention about John Quincy Adams, I believe he's our first president ever to be photographed. Um, but, uh, getting back to Andrew Jackson, Andrew Jackson is really hard to judge because he did a lot of good and he did a lot of bad. Um, as far as good stuff he did, he paid off the national debt, which was huge. It's the only time in our country's history we've ever been debt free. Uh, he got all white men the right to vote because previously you had to be a property owning white male and there might have been a couple other stipulations but he made it so that all white men could vote um which uh might not sound like much but considering the time it was a big step in the right direction um as far as negatives the trail of tears is a big one um a lot of people criticize him for being racist and for trying to shut down anti-slavery protests. Um, a lot of people view Andrew Jackson negatively today because he was so overtly racist. But I feel like you kind of have to consider the time in which he was living. Like, you have to keep in mind, back then... Like, everyone was racist, and a lot of the guys on this list were racist, at, at least to some degree. And uh, also, considering the time, I think a lot of people on the frontier were uh, supportive of getting rid of the natives because uh, they were trying to eke it out on the frontier, and these natives... Uh, keep attacking them and stuff and they would want them to be relocated elsewhere so i could see why he would do something like that even though it wasn't handled very well um a lot of like like i said a lot of people rate him lowly today uh uh the democratic party is taking down portraits and statues of him which in my opinion is wrong you shouldn't change history or erase history like history has peaks and valleys and you just kind of have to accept that and i think considering the time uh and considering everything he did um i think c tier is more than fair for Andrew Jackson, because like I said, he did a lot of good and he did a lot of bad. I may be a bit biased because I did a school project on him in seventh grade, but uh, those are my thoughts on him. Next, we have Martin Van Buren, um, who pretty much just tried to keep Andrew Jackson's policies going. He was our first president born in the United States, and by that I mean uh, not the first born on the land that would become the United States, but born in the nation of the United States. 
Uh, he was our first president, and I think so far only president, where English was not his primary language, Dutch was, and he's also famously the only president not related to, uh, I think, King George, whereas all the other presidents are. There's, I don't really know a whole lot about him, and frankly, I don't really want to learn anything about him. He's kind of one of our overlooked presidents. Uh, he continued the trail of tears that Andrew Jackson started. Um, he, uh, I don't think he was very good, but at the same time, he didn't completely screw anything up. And because of that, I'll put him in D tier. Next, we have SS Gigachad William Henry Harrison who, uh, unfortunately, I'm going to have to rank in the unrankable tier because he was only president for, like, 33 days. Um, it's kind of an urban legend that he got a cold from not wearing a jacket during his inauguration speech, uh, and that gave him pneumonia and killed him, but he actually didn't develop the sickness till. A couple weeks later. Um, I would rank him if he accomplished anything during his time in office, but I can't really seem to find anything on what he was actually able to do during that short period of time, and because of that I'm gonna have to make him unrankable. Next we have John Tyler uh, who was William Henry Harrison's vice president, and he kind of just became the president because of that. I really don't know anything about him. Uh, I know he had 16 kids amongst, uh, between two wives over the course of his life. That's a lot of kids. Um... And supposedly he has one living grandson today, which is really insane when you think about it. Because he must have had that kid, uh, the father of the guy who's still alive, when John Tyler was really, really old. And the grandson must be really, really old now. So I really don't know anything about this guy. Um... I'm going to dump him in T tier. Next, we have James K. Polk, who is often considered one of our most underrated presidents. And you know what? I got to say I agree with them. Um, as far as negatives go, he was a bit reckless Get in retrospect, getting us involved in the Mexican-American War. But we got Texas out of it. And uh, he also got us Oregon, or at least the southern half of Oregon, um, which was another big thing. And basically, uh, he's famous for campaigning on, I'm going to serve one term and get this, this, and this, and that done. And he went in office, got it done, stepped down after one term, and died of natural causes three months later. If that isn't a Chad move, I don't know what is. Um, I go back and forth between A and B tier on this guy, but because I don't think there's going to be a lot of A tiers, uh, and because getting all that territory for our country was uh, very beneficial for us in the long run, uh, I'm, I'm going to put him A tier. Uh, yeah, there we go. And next we have Zachary Taylor, who was only in office about a year and a half, uh, cause he died in office from eating some bad cherries and milk. Um, I don't really know much about him other than he was a general and he, uh, unlike someone like Eisenhower or Washington, he wasn't really a political or diplomatically minded general, so he wasn't really cut out for office. 
So, it, um, I, I honestly really don't know much about this guy. So, and he wasn't in office for very long. So I'm going to dump him in the D tier. Next, we have Millard Fillmore, everyone's favorite president. Um, uh, just kidding. He's probably one of our most forgettable presidents. Like, who who wants to learn about Millard Fillmore? Uh, as far as negatives go, he signed off on more fugitive slave acts. Like, there have always been fugitive slave acts, but... These made the punishments harsher, uh, which is not good. But to be fair, I'm going to put Millard Fillmore in the C tier just because I think he was our last pre-Civil War president who genuinely tried to keep the Union together. Uh, he signed the Compromise of 1850, which helped uh, arguably stave off the Civil War another 10 years. Uh, Zachary Taylor started drafting it, but he died. Uh, but Fillmore's administration finished it and signed off on it. So overall, there's nothing really bad I can say about him considering the time, but nothing super good either. Next, we have Franklin Pierce, uh, who many consider to be our most handsome, physically attractive president. And no homo, but I gotta concur, he is a very handsome man. Um, I almost want to give Franklin Pierce a gentleman's D minus just because I feel sorry for him but at the end of the day objectively I'm gonna have to give him an F. Supposedly he was a great public speaker but that doesn't really count for much um, in my book uh, and for those of you who don't know the reason I feel sorry for him is because on the train ride to his inauguration, he was in a train accident, and his son was decapitated in front of him. And uh, obviously, that scarred him and his wife. And uh, Franklin Pierce was always a drinker, but he really drank himself into a stupor after that. Uh, his wife, uh, I forget his name... Her first two years as first lady, she just kind of spent, kept up in a room in the White House and didn't want to go anywhere, or do anything, or see anyone. But toward the second half of Pierce's presidency, she did start coming out of her shell again and start uh, seeing people and organizing events and stuff. Um, but Pierce... Um, he was a weak president. Uh, he let the South basically do whatever they wanted. Um, he was a doe face, uh, meaning the South could just mold him into saying and doing whatever they wanted. Uh, he signed the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which... Uh, to be fair, at the time, I don't think he had the foresight to see what would happen with that. But basically, everyone rushed to Kansas and Nebraska to try to settle it, to make either state a pro-slavery uh, or pro-abolitionist state. And it further divided the nation and caused even more tensions. And Pierce didn't really do anything effective to stop that. Then we have James Buchanan, who's also going to go in the F tier, because he divides the nation even further. Um, he was pro-slavery. He actively didn't do anything to stop the South from seceding. Um, and again, he basically just let the South do whatever they want and let the country get more divided during his tenure. 
Um, on an unrelated note, uh, this has nothing to do with his ability to lead the country, but something interesting is a lot of people think that he was possibly our first gay or bisexual president because he was never married and he lived with a senator. I forget his name. He was someone from Ala the senator from Alabama, I think. And they shared a house together, even though they were these wealthy guys that could have easily afforded their own houses if they wanted to. And during his presidency, James Buchanan would write the guy saying stuff like, uh, I'm so lonesome here, how I crave for your company, and just just stuff that that makes it sound like they're a little more than just friends, you know? And then next, we have the Mac Daddy, Abraham Lincoln. And even though his military leadership is often criticized, you have to admit, Abraham Lincoln was a cunning politician and a master manipulator who knew exactly what to say to the right people to get what he wanted. Uh, basically, imagine Palpatine if he wasn't evil. At least that's how I like to think of Abraham Lincoln. Um, he wasn't perfect. He made some mistakes in decision-making, especially earlier in his presidency. But you have to admit, considering the tremendous weight of the decisions he had to make and the position our country was in at the time, I think he handled the situation extraordinarily well. And uh, I, it's hard to think of someone who would have done a better job. Um, and come on, guys, it's Abraham Lincoln. He was, uh, you can't not love the guy. The only real uh, negative uh, policy-wise I can think of for Abraham Lincoln is uh, with the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, he was really just doing it because he thought slavery was wrong and he, wanted, he did want to free the slaves, but it's not necessarily uh, because he thought blacks would be reintegrated into society like he thought they, like, basically the white majority population would never accept them. So the plan long term was to ship them back to Africa, <laughs> which is why we have the state of Liberia today. But again, um, and you can say uh, people romanticize Abraham Lincoln because he was assassinated and uh, people who are assassinated tend to be glorified like that. But I don't know. I, I feel like even if uh, he wasn't assassinated, I think he would still be looked on very positively today. And obviously he did so much good for the country and uh, it's kind of a cop out giving him S tier like everyone else, but Come on, guys, it's Abraham Lincoln. You, you just got to. Next, we have Andrew Johnson, who was Lincoln's vice president, who took over after he was assassinated. Um, I do feel a little bad for him in the sense that he had a bad childhood where he was an indentured servant with his brother, and they eventually ran away, I think. Um, but as a president, I don't think he was very good. He was very self-entitled guy and uh, snobby and arrogant. Um, he supported Jim Crow laws and 
Uh, some people say he almost single-handedly set back civil rights in this country a hundred years. I don't know if I'd go that far, but uh, his policies were not great for black people. Um, he was, the, I believe, the first president impeached, uh, but to be fair, they he was impeached because they made a law that they knew he was going to break, and he did, so they impeached him on that, and he wasn't voted out of office uh, over one vote. So, really lucky there. Other than that, I don't know too much else about him. Um, uh, because his legacy, especially with civil rights, is just so negative, um, I have to put him F tier. Next, we have Ulysses S. Grant. Um, I will admit I'm a bit biased toward Grant because I did three separate school projects on him. Uh, one in fifth grade, one in eighth grade, and I think one in my sophomore year of high school, too. Um, I'm more knowledgeable about his military career than I am his political one. Um, but from what I know, uh, he disbanded the KKK during his presidency. He really pushed for reconstruction in the South. And he did do a lot for civil rights. Uh, he gets a lot of criticism for having a corrupt cabinet during his tenure, but to be fair, I'm not sure how aware he was of that at the time. Um, people give him crap for being an alcoholic, which he wasn't really an alcoholic. He was just a binge drinker who would just drink a lot sometimes, um, and he's nowhere near as bad as, like, Franklin Pierce. I mean, Franklin Pierce was just totally intoxicated his whole time in office. I I don't really have any good justification for this uh, other than my own personal bias, but I think Grant is one of our more underrated presidents, and I'm gonna give him a B tier. Yeah. Next, we have Rutherford B. Hayes. He often gets blamed for Reconstruction ending uh, shortly after he entered office, but uh, I feel like he gets an unnecessary amount of hate for that just because Reconstruction, toward, especially toward the end of Grant's presidency, was really getting to be unpopular, and Grant ran for a third term. He lost, but he did attempt to run, and I think even if Grant did win and he did serve a third term, I think Reconstruction probably might have ended during his third term as well. So I can't really blame him too much for that. Um... Uh, other than that, I don't really know anything about Rutherford B. Hayes. Uh, I'm going to plop him in C tier because he seemed all right. Um, and spoiler alert, a lot of these Gilded Age presidents, I'm just going to burn through real quick. Like, I'm going to have, like, almost nothing to say about them <laughs> until we get to Teddy Roosevelt. So... <laughs> Uh, don't worry, I promise I will have more to say about the more modern, recent presidents. Uh, next was James Garfield, uh, who was a great speaker, very intelligent, uh, strong advocate for civil rights and Native American rights as well, um, and uh, so that the thing with the Native Americans, something Grant and Hayes didn't really seem to do was advocate for Native American rights, but Garfield did. Um, 
and he wasn't afraid of going against the interests of his own party, and he was a very uh, passionate man about what he believed in, and a lot of people speculate on what would have happened if he wasn't assassinated, um, and I personally think Garfield had a lot of potential. I think he had the potential to be an A-tier possibly even S to your president, but he just wasn't in there long enough. He was only in there five or six months. So uh, unfortunately, I'm going to have to bump him down to B tier, uh, which is still respectable though. I, I still think even during his short time, I think he was a good president. Next we have Chester A. Arthur. Um, he uh, didn't seem to like Chinese immigrants, and he signed the Chinese Exclusion Act, which was not very good, and he didn't really seem to do anything else uh, civil rights-wise, whether it was for blacks or natives. Um, as far as positives, uh, the only thing I have is he tried to fight corruption um, and the spoil system that got him in office in the first place. I don't really know anything else about this guy, so again, he seems all right, so I'll plop him in C tier. Uh, next is Grover Cleveland, who is our only president to serve two non-consecutive terms. Uh, he was our 22nd and 24th president. As a person, uh, I hear he was a pretty scummy human being. Um, he sexually assaulted a woman, and when she tried pressing charges, he had her put in a mental ward or something. And he married his 21-year-old cousin, who he started raising at 11. So he was basically the Woody Allen of his day. He, uh, as far as his actual policies go, um, he seemed pretty liberal for the time, um, but uh, a negative is he used federal troops to break up the Pullman strike um, in 1894, so I don't know. Um, it, I don't really know what to think of this guy. Uh, I'm going to plop him in the D tier. Next, we have everybody's favorite president, Benjamin Harrison. Apparently, he was a great public speaker, um, and he's also apparently the earliest president of which we have confirmed audio recordings, and you can listen to him on YouTube. Uh, the quality of the recordings is really bad because it was recorded on 1880s technology, but uh, we have his voice on record, and that's pretty cool. And he was William Henry Harrison's grandson. So how did he live up to his grandfather's legacy? I don't think very well. Um, he approved the overthrow of the Queen of Hawaii, and in 1890... He gave out medals of honor like candy for troops involved in the Wounded Knee Massacre. Uh, and 1890 was really late to be massacring Indians. You think they would have, uh, by the end of the 19th century, they would have uh, cleaned them out pretty good. But uh, he see the. I feel like his negatives. Uh, shine brighter than his positive. So because of that, I'm going to put him in D tier. Next, we have William McKinley. Um, he seemed a bit reckless and a bit uh, warmongery. Uh, he started the Spanish-American War over Cuba, and he had labor camps in the Philippines trying to expand there, and he was just kind of an expansionist for expansion's sake. So, uh, I mean, you could argue some good came out of that, but again, I think the bad outweighs the good. 
Uh, so I'm going to put him in D tier as well. Next, we have Teddy Roosevelt. Um, most famous for being a rugged outdoorsman and overall tough guy uh, who would box random people on the streets of Washington, D.C. Uh, over policy disagreements. And he would like arrange fist fights with congressmen over policy disagreements. He was apparently a brown belt in judo and even had a dojo in the White House during his tenure and lots and lots of exotic pets during his time in office. He is considered a bit reckless getting involved in interventionalism, but uh, I think the positives for Roosevelt greatly, greatly outweigh the negatives. Uh, he advocated for universal health care way back in the early 1900s. He was the first president to call the White House the White House. He hated corruption, tried to fight it, established a lot of national parks, uh, busted 44 trusts. Uh, he was against monopolies, wasn't afraid to go against his party, um, unlike William McKinley before him, where he was basically, uh, he basically just let uh, the corporations do whatever they wanted. Um, and he famously, after his presidency, uh, gave a speech after getting shot and held up the speech with the bullet hole in it and said, this is how much, this is how afraid they are of me that they want to get rid of me, which come on giga Chad move right there. And, uh, this is also kind of a cop out, but you know what? I'm going to give Teddy S tier because uh, he was just such an energetic, inspiring guy. And I feel like he got a lot of good done during his time in office. And he really fought for the common man. Uh, and... I, I think everyone really respects that about him. Uh, next, we have William Howard Taft. He was famously our fattest president at about 312 pounds. Little known fact about Taft, after his presidency, he apparently took diet and exercise very seriously and lost almost 100 pounds. If you look at pictures of him from during his presidency and compare them to pictures later in life, he's almost unrecognizable. So, just a little interesting thing there. Um, as far as accomplishments during his time in office, he was a reluctant leader in that he didn't really want to be president. He wanted to be chief justice on the Supreme Court, which he did become after his presidency. And he's more known for his accomplishments as a Supreme Court justice than a president. But as a president, um, he had a balanced cabinet. He was a generally pragmatic dude. Uh, he actually busted more trusts than Teddy Roosevelt. He busted 75. Uh, he did uh, let up on it later during his term, though. And that's why Teddy got mad at him and ran against him with the Bull Moose Party. But overall, I actually think William Howard Taft is one of our more underrated presidents. And... Uh, what the heck, I'm gonna give him a B tier. Next, we have Woodrow Wilson, who uh, is an interesting one, to say the least. To his credit, I will say he faced a lot of hardship and had to make a lot of tough decisions during his time in office. He did delay us getting into World War II, um, it, like, 
he famously campaigned in 1916 that he wasn't going to get us involved in World War II uh, after two years of not having us involved, but shortly after being reelected, uh, he gets us involved in World War II anyway. Um, but to be fair, if someone else was in charge during that time, I feel like they would have been more gung-ho about getting the U.S. involved. Um, and after World War II, his 14 points were in the right direction. But other than that, I think the bad greatly, greatly outweighs the good with this guy. Like, uh, everybody seems to hate Woodrow Wilson nowadays. And honestly, I can see why. Um, he was a huge racist. Um, and allow me to elaborate on that, because a lot of the guys on this list were probably pretty racist, but Woodrow Wilson made his racism an integral part of his policy making. Like, he segregated the federal government. First of all, he basically is single-handedly responsible for the KKK coming back after Ulysses Grant shut them down way back in the 1870s. And uh, he is famously quoted at the beginning of Birth of a Nation, which is often considered one of the most racist movies ever made. Uh, so for those of you who haven't seen Birth of a Nation, the full movie is on YouTube and I've actually watched it as a technical achievement it's an extremely well-made movie for 1915 standards. Like, there's a lot of revolutionary filmmaking techniques in there. And by 1915 standards, it is a really great film. It doesn't really get super racist until the final third, where uh, basically... And it's been a while since I've seen it, but basically... Uh, there's this white girl who gets chased by this black guy and there's no actual African Americans in the movie. It's all white people and black faced and she's getting chased by this, uh, black guy or what's supposed to be a black guy. And, uh, she winds up at the edge of a cliff and the black guy's coming after her and she jumps off the cliff because she would rather commit suicide than be sexually assaulted by the black man. And then the KKK rises up and they wear their hoods, ride their horses and drive all the black people out of town. And it's presented triumphantly as though the KKK is the heroic force and really, uh, pushes the lost cause myth and uh speaking of the lost cause myth woodrow wilson was uh a historian he was famously the princeton president uh and he had a phd in history but he was a terrible historian who believed in the southern lost cause myth and uh, because of that, he brought his beliefs to his policies to the point where uh, the, su the Red Summer, which is the summer of 1919, happens and he actively does nothing to stop it. Uh, which, for those of you who don't know, the Red Summer was in 1919. It was by far the most uh lynchings against black people and i think some other minorities too but mostly blacks uh across the whole country and woodrow wilson actively did nothing to stop it like he was probably like wow all these n-words are getting killed this is fantastic it's just like birth of a nation <laughs> and you're probably thinking uh, wasn't Andrew Jackson super racist too? Well, here's the thing. Uh, Andrew Jackson was racist and he did technically make it a part of his policy with the Trail of Tears. But the difference between Jackson and Wilson is Jackson didn't 
endorse genocide even indirectly like yes a lot of people died on the trail of tears but it was all because of malnutrition and uh disease but uh woodrow wilson just like straight up hated black people and uh not to mention he was a eugenicist so basic yes he uh endorsed eugenics so Woodrow Wilson was basically the closest thing to Hitler our country ever had. So let's be thankful that he wasn't more successful with a lot of these policies than he was. Prohibition started during his tenure. To be fair, I think he tried to veto the bill before it got passed, but I think it got passed anyway. But even still, it started under him and that will forever stain his legacy. Uh, he created the income tax, so if you're not a fan of income tax, you can thank Woodrow Wilson for that. During the last two years of his presidency, he was very sick, and he was basically bedridden. And his wife, Edith Wilson, kind of took over his duties. And it was during that time that women were granted the right to vote. And Woodrow Wilson gets credit for that. But here's the thing. I don't think he was really a, personally a fan of women getting the right to vote. I think it was just because, one, Edith was in charge and she probably did it because she was in a position to do it. And also, uh, by that point, there were protests on his front lawn and stuff. And he probably was just like, oh, all right. I'll, if he did do it, he was like, oh, all right, I'll do it if it'll just shut him up. Uh, overall, uh, he looks like Slugworth and from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. And, uh, overall, he was just a scummy, evil human being whose negative legacy, I think, greatly outweighs anything positive he did. And because of that, he earns a spot in the F tier. Next, we have William G. Harding. Um, he was apparently a terrible public speaker. Uh, he famously used the word normalcy instead of normality, which is how that word got created and how it started getting thrown around around the time of COVID. Um, he called for tax cuts for all, but most of them went to the wealthy. Um, as far as positives go, um, his Shepherd Tower Act uh, was a step in the right direction, which for those of you who don't know, tried to reduce infant mortality rate in impoverished areas. Um, overall, he seemed like a kind of ditzy, incompetent guy, um, but he didn't royally screw anything up, so... I don't know, I'll, I'll put him in the D tier. Next, we have Calvin Coolidge, who's really hard to judge because he didn't really do much during his tenure, but because he didn't do much, the nation prospered. He fought to protect women's rights and civil rights, he was a very libertarian and non-interventionalist president. Uh, libertarians love him because he was the closest thing to a libertarian president we've ever had. Um, a fun fact about him is supposedly he would ring the buzzer so and hide in his office so the Secret Service would have to find him. So he would basically just play hide and seek with them. And you know what? That is an ultra Giga Chad move. And <laughs> as silly as it is, and because of that, I'm going to put him A tier. Just because it makes me laugh. Next, we have Herbert Hoover, who's famous for mishandling the Great Depression. Uh, hold on a second, my cat wants to go outside. Alright, sorry about that. 
Uh, anyways, uh, Herbert Hoover, uh, the Great Depression happens, which to be fair, wasn't really entirely his fault. Um, but he goes about trying to fix it by raising taxes and tariffs, uh, which you think you would try to do the opposite. You would want to try to get goods and services going in and out of the country and less taxes so people have more disposable income to spend more money to stimulate the economy, but... Uh, I'm not an economics major or a finance person, so I really can't say for sure. He didn't do a great job with that, but uh, again, to be fair, I feel like it could have been worse and he didn't royally screw anything up or do anything super bad, so I'll give him a D tier. Next, we have FDR. He famously served four terms, the only president to serve more than two, and because of him, there's now a two-term limit for all future presidents, so we'll never have a president with more than two terms ever again. Um, he ended prohibition, which is a plus. Uh, he advocated for and started Social Security, which is good. Uh, the economic recovery from the recession was very slow, and it wasn't really any of FDR's policies that got us out of the Great Depression. It was World War II that really stimulated the American economy and got it back to where it should be. And the only reason the, that World War II was good for the American economy was because we were not actively being bombed and our facilities being destroyed and having to be rebuilt. And speaking of World War II, he was a strong leader during World War II. Um, he was famous for his fireside chats inspiring the people. Um, I know a lot of people rank him very highly at like S tier high. I don't think FTR is an S tier president. I think he's A tier. Uh, and really the Japanese internment camps are the sole reason uh, keeping him out of S tier for me. Because uh, there were an estimated like 100,000 people, Japanese people, sent to these, or ethnic Japanese people sent to these internment camps and I think out of the hundreds of thousands of people detained only like 10 or 15 of them were actual Japanese spies and like basically to my knowledge these internment camps were started just to basically just out of fear that there were Japanese spies living in America and it was wrong and really not the right way to handle it. That will forever be a stain on his legacy. But he did do a lot of good. Um, and because of that, I'm comfortable putting him in A tier. Next, we have Harry Truman, who, like Woodrow Wilson, also looks like Slugworth. He... Uh, famously dropped the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which some people agree with, some people disagree with. I personally think, given the circumstances, it was the right decision, or at least the least terrible option. So, uh, I'll give him credit for that. Um... He did get us involved in the Korean War, though, which wasn't ideal, but I can understand, given the time, why he did it. And uh, considering the time uh, he was president, I feel like his decisions made sense. Um, so I can't really reprimand him for anything bad. Um, I really don't know a whole lot about him, but what I do know is, uh, his decisions seem to have panned out for the better, 
and uh, I'm gonna put him A tier. Next, we have Dwight D. Eisenhower, the World War II general. He started the interstate highway system, um, which, I mean, every American's life pretty much is affected by it in one way or another, directly or indirectly. So that's huge plus. Um, he sent Marines to Little Rock to force integration, basically. Um, he had kind of a similar stance to Washington, to my knowledge, as far as surrounding himself with people uh, who can make better decisions than him. Uh, I can't think of the quote off the top of my head, but I think there's a Dwight D. Eisenhower quote that says, like, I don't have to be the smartest man in the room. I just have to surround myself with smart people to make the right decision. And uh, that's like a similar ideology or mentality to what Washington had. And I think that really worked out for him. And that's a good way of doing things. He seemed like a generally good natured, common sense, pragmatic guy. He helped get us out of the Korean War. Uh, he wanted to fight communism, but didn't like the extreme measures McCarthyism was going for. He uh, was a general in World War II, but he was a diplomatic uh, general, like he was a big planner. Um, and I think because of that, uh, that experience translated very well to the White House. And uh, they say, we like Ike. And you know what? I like Ike. And I'm going to give him A tier. Uh, the only real negative I can think of for him is when leaders of small countries like African countries would come to the White House. He would send Nixon to meet with them because uh, he didn't deem them worthy of his time. Um, so uh, I don't really know what to think of that. Um, but come on, man, like you're a world leader. Other world leaders want to meet with you at least at least give them lip service, you know, but Still a great president, I think. Next, we have John F. Kennedy. I personally think JFK is a little overrated, and I think people glorify him for uh, because he was assassinated. He had a lot of achievements, uh, but the things he was famous for, like... Uh, the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis were things that were problems he started. Uh, to be fair, though, he did handle the Cuban Missile Crisis extremely well. The Bay of Pigs, not so much. Um, he advocated for national health care. Um, he was a very inspiring speaker. Uh, he was probably our last, like, super inspiring president that everyone could get behind. Uh, and his famous speech where he says, uh, we will land a man on the moon by the end of the decade. And they act, and that, I think because of that speech, that's what really prompted people to want to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. Uh, his, uh, ask not what your country can do for you, but you can do for your country speech, uh, will always follow his legacy. He, uh, won the election by a narrow margin against Nixon. And, uh, people say he won because of, television and how he was so much more natural on camera but um 
he also didn't win by a big margin because a lot of people voted against him because he was Catholic and Irish. And uh, I don't know if it's just me looking at it through modern eyes, but come on, American people, that that just seems a bit petty. Like, come on, get with the program. Um, I think JFK had the potential to be an A-tier or possibly even S-tier president, kind of like James Garfield, but similar to James Garfield, he just wasn't in office long enough, so I have to bump him down to a B. And uh, considering the length of his time in office, uh, I think that's fair. And then after... Uh, JFK is assassinated, his vice president, Lyndon B. Johnson, takes over. LBJ, he did some good, he did some bad. Uh, he escalated the Vietnam conflict um, and sent more troops there. JFK started sending troops there, but LBJ really ramped it up. Um, and that's like the big negative people bring up with LBJ is the fact that he sent so many people to Vietnam. Um, he was also infamous for his bad conduct and how he would basically just intimidate people with his huge stature uh, and whipping his dick out and, like, forcing people to talk to him while he's taking a dump on the toilet. Uh, just to make him uncomfortable. He was basically just like a big bully. Um, but there were still good things he did, like the Civil Rights Act. He tried to fight poverty. Um, the poverty rate uh, did go down, but then stayed consistent, and it's pretty much stayed consistent ever since. In addition to the Civil Rights Act, there was the Voting Rights Act. I respect him because he overcame his racism because earlier in his life uh, as a more local politician, he supported Jim Crow laws, but when he became president, he supported civil rights because he said, once you become the president, you feel responsible for all Americans and it was at that point I knew I had to sign off on that bill because of what it was what was best for everyone. And, and you know what? I respect him for that. And uh, apparently uh, he had a really big dick and no homo, but this could just be the uh, primal tribalistic side of my brain coming out. But there's something reassuring about knowing that your leader has a big cock. So, for those reasons, I'm going to put LBJ in C tier. Next, we have Richard Nixon. Nixon is a president I have a lot of respect for. Um, I know people who really liked Richard Nixon uh, when he was in office. He did some good stuff. Uh, he was the first president to visit China. He created the EPA. He got us out of Vietnam, which was good. Um, and I respect him for being one of the few presidents who didn't go to an Ivy League school. Like, he worked his way to the top, and I really respect him for that. I do. But as I feel like the negatives outweigh the positives for him. Uh, like, I besides Watergate, uh, there were a lot of other scandals and incidents where he was just very dishonest with the public. Um, he starts the war on drugs, which I'll talk more about when we talk about Reagan. He just, I don't know. He was just really corrupt and pretty transparent about it, too. 
And I, I, again, I recognize he did some good stuff, uh, but he did a lot of bad stuff too. And I feel like the bad outweighs the good for him. So I feel like D tier is fair for Nixon. Next, we have Gerald Ford, uh, our only president to have not been elected vice president or president. Uh, he's our only Eagle Scout president, uh, and from one Eagle Scout to another, uh, gotta show him respect. He uh, seems like he was a generally nice, honest, pragmatic guy. Um, he survived two assassination attempts within two weeks, both by women. Uh, one of the women, I think, was a member of the Manson family. I forget who the other woman was, but that's kind of a interesting little tidbit about his presidency. He wasn't really in office long enough to make a huge impact. Um, I feel like he had the potential to be a B-tier president, but because... He pardoned Nixon. I have just for that one decision alone, I have to bump him down from B tier to C tier. Cause I think that, and I know there's been corruption in the government before Watergate, but pardoning Nixon of Watergate was the catalyst, I think, to make politicians in this country think, oh, we can get away with anything. We don't have to be accountable for anything. And uh, I think the long-term ramifications for that have been very negative. And because of that, I can't really uh, forgive him for that. And if you look at his approval ratings, uh, they start off high, like 75%, and then the second he pardons Nixon, they drop to like 43% and they stay there the remainder of his term. So I can kind of see why he did it, but personal, personally, I think he should have done what I think would have been the right thing to do, and that was not pardon Nixon and hold him accountable for it. Again, just to set the precedent that there has to be consequences for this stuff, which we'll be getting into more detail on later. Uh, next, we have our first living president, or I should say the first one on this list who's still alive, Jimmy Carter. Like Ford before him, JC seems like a generally uh, sensible, honest, humble guy. Uh, he's much better known for his post-presidency than his actual presidency. Again, if this list was judging each person's entire life or judging them as a person, judging their character, this would be a very different list. And Jimmy Carter would be toward the top for me because he's... Uh, he's had probably the best post-presidency ever because he uh, started Habitat for Humanity. He built houses with them. Uh, he still builds houses with them, I think, at least once a year, like one month a year, I think. And he he's almost 100 and he's still doing it. And he taught Sunday school at his local church uh up until one or two years ago, like the guy uh, is such a nice, hard worker, and you can tell like he's a really selfless guy and just a really good human being. And uh, like uh, of all the people on this list, of all these presidents in front of us right here. Jimmy Carter is honestly the one I would most want to just hang out and have a beer with at a barbecue and just hang with. Uh, he just seems like a really great guy. Uh, he lived a really great life, did a lot of great things. 
but unfortunately, I don't think his presidency was one of the high points. Uh, there was the Iran hostage crisis, which uh, I don't think he handled very well. Uh, there was mega inflation during his term, which, to be fair, he wasn't really... It wasn't really his fault, but still, it uh, the inflation we're having now is the biggest inflation since the inflation during his presidency. Um, there was the oil gas prices, oil gas crisis caused by the embargo on OPEC countries, um, and that will be a stain on his legacy. And overall, he was just like kind of a weak uncharismatic president and then when he runs for re-election in 1980 he goes up against ronald reagan who's of course the great communicator and so like what did you think was going to happen so jimmy carter i love him as a person don't really love him as a president uh to be fair, I don't think he royally screwed anything up during his time in office. So once again, for that reason, I'm putting him D tier. Up next, we have Ronald Reagan, who is one of our most divisive presidents. Some people think he's F tier. Some people think he's S tier. Um, I think... Reagan is more D tier uh, because he did some good, he did some bad, and personally, I think the bad outweighs the good for me, um, and I'm going to try to explain why. Uh, Ronald Reagan, he was the great communicator, like I said, he was a great public speaker, um, he... Uh, really tried to end communism but overall um i think the bad outweighs the good like the war on drugs um which was started by nixon jimmy carter kind of kept it going but it really ramps up under reagan reagan was a huge proponent of the war on drugs and uh Especially in hindsight now, the war on drugs was one of the biggest wastes of money ever. It was a complete, unmitigated failure. And by having drugs be illegal, you are basically incentivizing the criminal empires that generate so much money from illegal drugs to continue... And because they're so expensive, people ruin their lives financially sometimes uh, with their drug addictions. And when you have uh, lesser drugs like marijuana, people still go to jail for it and get ridiculous sentences. Like I've heard stories of people getting 30 years for weed, which is absolutely ridiculous. Like marijuana should absolutely be legal like it does less damage to you than alcohol it's one of the mildest drugs out there and honestly it really should just be legal and the only reason it's illegal the only reason is because of uh the hemp industry gaining momentum in the 1930s and the timber industry was afraid of the competition and so they campaigned to make it illegal and that's how we got reefer madness um when i was younger i used to think milder drugs like marijuana and mild hallucinogen should be legal but the hard stuff like coke meth and heroin should stay illegal because that stuff is the stuff that ruins lives but if you look at Portugal, Portugal decriminalized all drugs in 2001, and they're doing all right. Like, it's not like everyone is going to run around high all the time, and there's going to be 
like awful uh crime rates and accident rates or and stuff like that like just just decriminalize everything at, at least that's my stance on it and frankly uh it it would just make everything easier anyways there was the iran contra affair which uh really reagan and all the north should have uh gotten arrested for but again because of watergate no one wants to be accountable for anything so they didn't prosecute them for that um uh reagan was infamous for trickle down economics and trickle down economics does not work um he is given a lot of credit for the fall of communism but communism didn't fall under him it fell under george h w bush and technically and the thing is reagan would not have gotten anywhere near as much progress with that if it wasn't for gorbachev the only reason the relationships between the ussr and the united states softened was because uh gorbachev was willing to compromise and this might just be uh looking back on history with 2020 hindsight but by the end uh by the 1980s by 1980 when reagan takes office communism is really on the decline and gorbachev knew it and he looked at the state the soviet union was in and he was like dude this communism thing it's as is it's not sustainable we have to open ourselves up to the rest of the world we've got to open up uh our economy to the outside world uh we gotta stop having so many human rights violations really the only reason reagan got anything done with that is because uh gorbachev wanted to and i personally i think gorbachev is one of the most underrated historical figures of the last several decades but that's just me um and Reagan, in these meetings, he would tell these really lame jokes and, like, tell them over and over again. And he would fall asleep even in some of these meetings. Like, dude, I, I know you're old, you're in your 70s when you're in office here, but you can't do that. Like, could you imagine if Obama or Trump or Biden fell asleep in a meeting today, they would get crucified on social media. But I guess because Reagan was Reagan, he got away with it. Yeah, overall, I, I don't think too highly of Reagan. And um, if you haven't noticed, and I don't think he's awful. He did some good i think but he also did more bad than good and for me the bad is a real stain on his legacy and that's why i put him in d tier <sighs> next we have george h w bush uh who was reagan's vice president i'll put him in c tier he was all right he was a decent president uh, he was a pretty moderate, pragmatic guy. A big plus for him is the Americans with Disabilities Act, which uh, I think is a very good thing um, and positively impacted the lives of millions of Americans. So I'm glad he did that. Um, he did get us involved in the Gulf War, which was a bit questionable. Um, he infamously said, read my lips, no new taxes. And then later in his presidency, he winds up raising taxes anyway. But 
overall, he didn't do anything super bad, but he didn't do anything, like, outstandingly amazing either, so, uh, I don't know, uh, I think C tier is fair for him, I don't know a whole lot about him, but, uh, he seemed alright, oh, and, uh, one other thing about George H.W. Bush, uh, he threw up on the Japanese Prime Minister, so, uh, not necessarily a good or bad thing, uh, just kind of a fun fact I like to tell people. Next, we have Bill Clinton, who uh, I'm also going to put in the C tier. Uh, he was also alright. He was the last president who seemed to take the national debt seriously. Um, he was the last president with a budget surplus during his term. Um, not to say he didn't, not to say he had an easy job or anything, but uh, I will say that during the 90s, the 90s were a prosperous, peaceful time for the United States. Like, the economy was going good, there were no wars the United States was involved with, except maybe the Bosnia, Yugoslavia affairs, uh, communism had just fallen, so, like, America was just generally in a pretty good place, and, uh, things were going good. The reason I don't really rate Bill Clinton any higher than C is because uh, I don't really have any, uh, specific examples to give you right now, but... Uh, he just kind of seemed like a scummy guy who did whatever he had to do to get what he wanted. Um, I don't think he's as bad as Hillary when it comes to that, but uh, I just kind of get that vibe from him. And I, I guess you could say they're meant for each other in that regard. Um, I will say, though, he's a good sax player. Um, I think every world leader should play a musical instrument. The world would be a better place because of it. So, moving on to George W. Bush, Bush Jr. Um, this is the first president I remember being president. Um, I was born during Bill Clinton's administration, but I don't really have any memories of Bill Clinton while he was in office. Um, George W. Bush was the first president I remember being president and having as my president. George Bush, uh, I think when he started, he was just kind of trying to ride Bill Clinton's high um, and just continue the prosperous times uh, that the United States was going through, uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s. He did some tax cuts for the rich early in his presidency, and he spent a lot of time on vacation, uh, and I think, uh, he was just trying to coast through his presidency, but then 9-11 happens, and, uh, to be f fair, he handled that the way he was supposed to handle it. Uh, I don't consider it a huge plus, uh, just because, uh, frankly, with any disaster like that, et or event th uh, thing, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> uh, any president should have handled it well. And if they didn't, I would have to create like a quadruple F minus tier just for them. Uh, the immediate aftermath of 9 11, he handled well, but uh, it was everything else that followed that really stains his legacy for me. The Patriot Act, I think, is one of the worst laws ever passed in American history. Uh, it created this surveillance state where the government uh, watches everything you do and listens to everything you say, which is a really kind of totalitarian thing to do, and a, a lot of people are against it. Um, 
the invasion of Iraq, I understand why he did it, uh, even if it was a bit of an emotional response to America being attacked. Uh, it seemed to have initially went well, but it soured pretty quickly. Um, the recession starts late in his presidency, uh, and he bailed out big corporations to try to restart the economy, um, but it didn't really work. Um, there was no child left behind, uh, which got a lot of backlash because the government controlled uh, everything and it... Uh, held back money from poor districts due to poor test scores and for that and to my knowledge at least for that reason that's why uh, people advocate for education being a state's right uh, George Bush is when I think back on everything he did even when he tried to do something good it seemed to backfire on him one way or another uh, and because of that, I struggled to think of anything good he really did. Bush left the White House in disgrace, basically, because uh, after 9-11, his approval ratings skyrocketed to 90%. But then by the end of his presidency, uh, People saw just how badly everything was going domestically and foreign policy wise, and uh, his approval ratings plummeted to like 22 or 24 percent, like some of the lowest ever. And even hardline conservatives who voted for him in 2000 and 2004 hated him by 2008. And like I said, he left the White House in disgrace and basically just left the mess for Obama to clean up or at least try to clean up because I can't really think of any long term good Bush did. And he pretty definitively left the country in a worse state than how he found it eight years prior I kind of have to give him an F. I'm sorry, George, but I'm sure you're a nice guy, but your presidency uh, wasn't very good. Not at all. Next, we have uh, Barack Obama. Barack Obama, he was a good public speaker, if prepared, but uh, off the cuff, he was a little awkward. Uh, Bill Clinton was good off the cuff, and that's one thing I really like about him. But Obama, uh, not as much. I'm not going to do the impression the whole time, <laughs> thankfully. Uh, uh, for me, uh, Obama, when I think Obama, I think uh, missed opportunity. Um, I think he genuinely tried to do a lot of good, uh, and he tried to fight corruption in government, but, uh, really to no real avail. Um, a majority of his presidency, as I said before, was just cleaning up Bush's messes. Um, he, uh, kind of kept Bush's foreign policy of staying in the Middle East, but he did ramp up drone warfare, I guess, to appease people who didn't want actual physical soldiers on the ground who would get killed. Instead, it's just robots bombing targets. Um, I think Bush might have started the drone strikes, but Obama really ramped it up. Um... He did, uh, uh, well, not him personally, but uh, Osama bin Laden was assassinated um, on, during his administration, and that was a huge morale boost for our country, and um, uh, Al-Qaeda seemed to be on the decline,
But then Isis rises up, and uh, I understand why Obama stayed in the Middle East, because he's like, well, uh, there's this uh, new terrorist group uh, in the Middle East, and they're called ISIS. And uh, what are we going to do? Not fight ISIS? Uh, we got to show them the American way. We got to show them who's boss. So I, I understand why he... Uh, retain that foreign policy, even though, again, uh, the Middle Eastern conflicts weren't going great, and we really, for the most part, didn't really need to be there. As far as domestic policies go, Obamacare was kind of a mixed bag, depending on who you ask. Uh, some people uh, really liked it and benefited from it. Um, I know doctors uh, who were practicing when Obama was in office, and they think Obamacare is bullshit. Um, and one of the reasons for that was Obamacare was written by private healthcare providers, so it wasn't really true government assistance. Um, he was also slow to act on gay marriage. He did legalize it in the middle of his second term, but he never talked about it until the beginning of his second term, and I'm not really sure why. I feel like uh, that could have been something he could have advocated more strongly for. Um, and that leads me to one of my big problems with Obama was that his, vet, his rhetoric was vague and he just didn't really seem to stand for anything specific. And I feel like he kind of used his race as a trump card to land his place in office. Because, frankly, I feel like at least some voters voted for him just because he was black. So then we can say, we voted for the first black president. I I do think Obama tried to do good, but it's during his presidency where the friction between, for at least from my perspective, the friction between the Democrats and Republicans becomes really apparent. The gridlock becomes very apparent, and uh, just like nothing gets done. No one wants to pass anything. And because of that, Obama doesn't get a lot of stuff done, necessarily. Um, I don't think he was a bad president. Um, I used to think he was a decent president. Like, he wasn't amazing or anything, but he was alright. Um, I feel like the more I learn about him, the more my opinion of him sours. But... Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to give Obama a C tier with the stipulation that it's a low C, like a C minus, because, uh, I don't think he's D tier bad. I think he, uh, was fairly decent, but I feel like my opinion on him could change over time and who knows, he might go down to that D tier. Uh, only time will tell. Next, we have Donald Trump, and uh, fasten your seatbelts, people, because uh, of all the people on this list, this is the one I have by far the most to say about. Here's my thing with Donald Trump, um, and I'm going to use my tier list here to illustrate how my opinion of him changed over time. Uh... When I first saw that Donald Trump was running for president, uh, I had this fleeting thought that, oh, maybe he could be a B-tier president. He could be uh, an outsider who can shake things up and uh, maybe get some 
different kind of laws passed that uh, no other seasoned politician wouldn't want to bring up. And uh, he would uh, do good for the economy because he's a businessman and he would understand how the economy works. But then I remembered, oh wait, Donald Trump is actually a terrible businessman and he's declared bankruptcy at least three times. And that made me bump it down to C tier. But I still had this inkling thought that maybe Donald Trump would be decent. And then the election of 2016 happens. And basically Donald Trump's campaign strategy was, I'm going to say and do all these ridiculous things so the media pays all their attention to me so they don't have any time to focus on all the other candidates. So, uh, they, the people have no choice, but to elect me. And to be fair, it did actually kind of work and his actions and words didn't really scare me at that point because I'm like, Oh, he's just uh, acting silly just to get elected. When he actually gets in office, uh, the checks and balances of our system and his uh, advisors and other people in his administration are going to keep him on the right path. They're going to keep him in check and make sure he doesn't do or say anything dumb when he's actually president if he's elected. And just to... And I want to reiterate, uh, the only reason Donald Trump won is because he went up against Hillary Clinton. If any other Democrat was nominated, Donald Trump wouldn't have been president. So Donald Trump becomes president and the first three months or so was kind of fun because he's a very memeable guy and he's funny to watch and listen to, and I just got a big laugh out of him, and I loved uh, looking at all the funny memes on the internet, and I thought, okay, this guy is uh, kind of a doofus but when it comes to politics, but uh, you know what? Like, he's not hurting anyone. He's not doing anything bad, right? Well, the first th- after the first three months of his presidency... Um, the remaining three and three quarter years, I would say Donald Trump went down to a D tier for me. And really the, the list just goes on and on and on. Like I have an entire page of notes scribbled out on stuff Donald Trump did. And I don't think I've even scratched the surface. Like the more I research about this guy, the more I look up about him, like, the more, the further down the rabbit hole you go, the more ridiculous it gets. Uh, first of all, Donald Trump is a terrible public speaker. Uh, people say Warren G. Harding was bad. I think Donald Trump might be our worst public speaker president. Because look up a transcription of a Trump speech and... It reads like, I know this guy. He's a great guy. He He's a farmer. Farmers are great for America. And it reads like a third grader wrote it. And it's like, it's so infuriating to read. It, it, it's just, it just melts your brain trying to read it. Trump was a guy who became president pretty much just for his own ego, just so he can say, I'm the president of the United States. Trump didn't care about the average American. The only issue that he was super passionate about was immigration because he hated Mexicans and he hated Muslims and he was really passionate about trying to keep Muslims and Mexicans out of the country. But other than that, he just didn't care about the remaining 90% of the job. Like, can we talk about the wall for a second? Because I feel like I have to bring up the wall. Trump, do you know 
how long the American border is with Mexico, it's got to be like over a thousand miles. It This isn't like the 38th parallel in South and North Korea where it's only a hundred miles or a couple hundred miles and there's a armistice for a war between these two nations going on and that's why they built a wall there. No, it's just there's immigrants coming in from Mexico and we got to keep them out. Like, do you know, and how, how was Mexico supposed to pay for that, Donald? Uh, how are you going to convince them of that? And uh, another thing, Donald, uh, how are you going to stop immigrants that come into the country legitimately, but just become illegal immigrants because they overstay their visas and just never leave? Uh, how are you going to track them down, Donald? And, and, oh, and fake news. Can we talk about fake news? That fake news was basically Donald Trump's catchphrase or one of his many catchphrases. And he basically, uh, w like if a reporter asked him a question, he didn't want to answer. Uh, he would just say, that's a stupid question. I don't know why you would ask that question. Who's your employer? They should fire you. They should be ashamed of you. And uh, whenever someone brought up, like, anything negative about him, he's like, fake news, it's all fake news, it's all a conspiracy. And because of that fake news mindset that, like, you can't trust anyone, he brought out the worst in conspiracy nuts who would come up with ridiculous theories on, like, anything related to anything because they think, Everyone is lying to them. He brought out the worst in the far left. I'm sorry, the far right, uh, because uh, of his immigration policies that really sparked far right movements with uh, racists liking Donald Trump because they thought he was racist. And uh, getting back to the fake news thing, Trump himself is saying all this incorrect fake stuff. Like, uh, when he was running for re-election in 2020, I remember a speech where he's like, four more years, why not 10 more years? And I'm like, dude, th that's not how it works. Like, do you not know how long you can be president? Like, or, or is this, like, foreshadowing some kind of, uh, like... Uh, thing that you're going to change the policy on that? Like, like, what are you talking about? And when COVID happens, uh, he uh, set, makes this offhand remark like, bleach will clean your blood, drink the bleach, it'll clean out your COVID. Like, no, you, you can't joke about that stuff. When you're a world leader in a position of authority like that, you have to remain dignified, and you can't make jokes about that. Like, you just can't. Like, I don't know what this guy's thinking. He, he just, he's just so infuriating. One comment I have on Trump, uh, it's not necessarily a good or bad thing, but uh, he made the Gateway Arch in Missouri a national park. Um, and I know a national park doesn't necessarily have to be a natural area. Um, but like, for example, the Smithsonian in Washington, DC is technically a national park, but like, why the arch in St. Louis? Like, why does that deserve to be a national park? Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm just ignorant. Maybe if there's anyone from Missouri who can leave a comment and let me know why the arch is so amazing and deserves to be a national park, let me know. Because that was just kind of a confusing move to me. Now, to Trump's little credit, before COVID, the economy was doing well. Uh, it had recovered to a point where it was similar to the late 90s. 
uh, like during Bill Clinton's administration when the United States was very prosperous and economically doing very well, but then COVID happens and Trump, uh, it could have been, he could have handled it worse, uh, but I think he could have handled it a lot better too. Uh, my big problem with how he handled it was he was too complacent and he really didn't take it seriously. Um, like he's like, Oh, just a few hundred Americans died. It's no big deal. This COVID thing's going to blow over. But then eventually more and more people kept dying. And he's like, Oh, I guess this is a serious thing. I guess we actually have to do something about it now. Dang it. What bumps Donald Trump down into the F tier for me was the 2020 re-election campaign because Donald Trump was just so unbelievably petty with trying to get re-elected. Like, I'm sure there have been ugly elections in American history, like the election of 1800 is a famous one, the election of 1876 is another famous one, but the election of 2020... I don't know if any other presidential candidate was just so childish with how desperately they wanted something. Like, he's he just spent the whole re-election whining. It's, it's all voter fraud. It's all fake news. The votes have to be recounted. There's a bunch of fake votes. Mail-in votes shouldn't count. And there's the infamous debate where uh, he interrupts Biden like 70 times again, basically like a child, like, uh, like, dude, be, be an adult, wait your turn. Like, this is just so petty, like, and what, and, and, oh, and one thing about the fake votes and the mail-in votes is there was a survey done on fake votes, and I remember Georgia and Pennsylvania. Georgia, they found two fake votes. Uh, not 2,000, not 2 million, two. And Pennsylvania, there was one. Not 1,000, not 1 million, one. And the thing with that one vote from Pennsylvania was it was a vote for Donald Trump. Now, I've already established that Donald Trump has been edged into the F tier, but what really solidifies him as F tier for me is the January 6th incident. Uh, I'm not going to call it a riot nor an insurrection because we don't really know enough to really say what it was. Uh, in my personal opinion, I don't think there was necessarily anything planned, uh, but I think there were people there intending to start something. There were people looking to riot and cause trouble there. So Donald Trump, uh, before uh, the incident happens, gives this speech where he's basically incentivizing people to start something where he's like, you have to have extreme courage in these times and you got to show them who's boss and do the right thing. You got to uh, sh go down there and show them uh, what we're all about and stuff like that, which didn't directly say uh, attack the Capitol building, but, uh, it was kind of implied he wanted them to do something about it. And now, in my opinion, if you are holding a political office and you are running for re-election for that political office in that same country, I don't care what country it is, if you say the system that got me elected is fraudulent and you all should 
go overrun that system and take it over, that is treason. That is going against the system of government you currently oversee. And Donald Trump should have been, if not arrested, at the very least voted out of office and barred from ever holding office again within 24 hours. I don't care if Mike Pence was made president for two weeks just to be a babysitter until Biden took office, but that's what should have been done. But because of Watergate, it, uh, uh, that's why I keep bringing it up, no one wants to be accountable for anything in government anymore. They didn't prosecute Trump because they didn't want to be held accountable for anything they did themselves. And frankly, that is some weak ass shit. Anyways, uh, I gotta move on or else I'm gonna be talking about Trump all night. So, uh, in short, that is my case for Donald Trump being an F-tier president. I don't think he's the worst president we've ever had. Um, but he's definitely top five for me, um, because I just struggle to think of anything good he did, and his negatives far, far outweigh his positives for me. So, with that, let's move on to Joe Biden. Now, this is exciting for me, because... I don't think any other U.S. president tier list on YouTube has Joe Biden on it. Now, he is the incumbent president. He's still in office, and he's only been in office for about 18 months. But if uh, he passed away or uh, resigned or whatever, stepped down from office, and these 18 months were all he ha we had to work with to judge him on, I think we have enough to work with. If, if I could rank Zachary Taylor, JFK, James Garfield, I can rank Biden too. So Biden, during the 2020 campaign, uh, his campaign was basically... I'm a common sense, pragmatic, sane person who's not Donald Trump. Um, and I don't know if that campaign would have worked with uh, anyone other than Donald Trump in office. Um, it's not necessarily a high bar, but after Donald Trump being in office, uh, I think it was good enough. And you know what? It worked. It got him elected. I'm indifferent on him. I can take him or leave him. He seemed fine, which, frankly, after Trump, uh, was a huge step up because I can't stand Trump. As far as his ranking, I think Joe Biden has the potential to be, at best, C-tier and, at worst, D-tier. So... For the time being, I'm going to be conservative with my rating and give him a D. Um, I will say I really have a lot of respect for him for pulling out of Afghanistan. Because Bush got us in there. Obama said he was going to get us out. Didn't get us out. Trump said he was going to get us out. Didn't get us out. And Biden was just like, look, the bullshit has gone on long enough. We, look, we're clearly making no progress here. And it's just a absolute quagmire. And we have to just get out of here and let uh, the Afghan people fend for themselves. And... Uh, I have a lot of respect for him for that. Um, the actual evacuation was sloppy, and there was a lot of criticism for that uh, with 
American military hardware being left in the country after August 31st and a lot of refugees trying to get out that couldn't. Um, but you know what? Uh, all these problems in the Middle East, or at least most of them, frankly, they just got to figure it out for themselves. Like... Without getting into too much detail, I just think, and I realize the situation there is very complicated, and I honestly don't understand all of it, but uh, when it comes to uh, stuff like uh, women's rights, like when we pulled out of Afghanistan, a lot of people were like, but what about uh, the women who are going to be oppressed and... Uh, in other parts of the Middle East, the religious tolerance and religious fighting, you know what, they just gotta all figure it out for themselves. Like, uh, I realize uh, this is a much simpler uh, comparison, but like the 30 years war in Europe a bit about uh, Catholicism versus Protestantism, uh, the war went on for 30 years, but after a while, there was no clear winner or loser, and they just said, guys, we can't keep killing each other. We just gotta accept tolerance here. Like, it's the only way we're gonna get on with our lives and progress as a society. Or, like, slavery in the South in America, even if the Confederates won the American Civil War, they probably would have gotten rid of slavery not long afterwards, because by this point in world history, slavery was really going out of style. The British Empire had already made slavery illegal, and most developed nations, even back then, would have looked at slavery as this primitive thing and they wouldn't want have wanted to trade with the United States and the the Confederate or the Confederate States of America I should say and the Confederacy would have had to have banned slavery to progress in the world and uh I, I know I'm greatly oversimplifying things, and the situation in the Middle East is much, much more complicated than that. But you know what? They just got to figure it out for themselves. Um, Biden has been continuing the drone strikes, although he has greatly reduced them. Uh, like, Obama ramped them up, Trump kept them going, but Biden's been uh, dialing them back which I also respect. Um, my big criticism with Biden is not necessarily anything he's done, but just what he hasn't done. Uh, his administration has been aimless, and uh, he's just a weak, boring leader, uninspiring with no charisma. Um at least that's the vibe I get from him. Uh, in his younger years, he had more charisma, but now he's just too old, I think. And honestly, because of his age, uh, I don't know how successful a re-election campaign will be in 2024. Um, there's the possibility that Trump could pull a Grover Cleveland and try to run for two non-consecutive terms. But honestly, he lost a lot of support um, after the 2020 election, and I am optimistic that he won't get it back. But I do think he's going to run, at, like at least attempt it. His ego won't let him not run. But yeah, overall, um, getting back to Biden... Um, Politics now is basically just a show where either side doesn't want to budge. And the reason uh, he's had so much trouble 
with the environmental bills and the infrastructure bills, even though these are objectively good things that would be good for the country, the Republicans don't want to pass these laws unless there is a Republican in the White House, because otherwise it would make them look bad. And this uh, gerrymandering, this gridlock, this show is the exact bullshit George Washington was warning us about way back in the fucking 1790s. Frankly, I think we're in kind of a dark age of presidents. Like, if you look at my tier list, we haven't had an A-tier president in 70 years, a B-tier president in 60 years. Um, there's been no one really inspiring in my lifetime running for president. Like, I have not seen a single presidential candidate in my lifetime where I looked at them and I went, wow, I want to vote for that guy. Like, and again, it's a result of the two-party system being a two-party system for too long. The last genuinely inspiring president we had was JFK, I'd say. Um, you could argue Jimmy Carter just for his post-presidency. Uh, Obama, some people I could see finding inspirational just because he was our first minority president. And like that will forever be a positive milestone for the presidency. But uh, other than that, we need someone to go in there and not be afraid to shake things up and expose corruption, and just, like, have everyone just be decent human beings. Like, uh, people thought they were going to get that with Obama and Trump, but both of them failed spectacularly in that regard. In my opinion, we need, at the very least, a third major party to shake things up to keep the Democrats and Republicans on their toes. I don't care if it's a Green Party or a Libertarian Party or someone resurrects Teddy Roosevelt and brings back the Bull Moose Party. Uh, the Democrats and Republicans have been uh, keeping this shtick up for too long and it, it's just got to stop. They just got to say, look, we have to just do what's best for the people and not our uh, freaking corporate interests and junk. Um, I hate to end the video on a negative note, so I will say um, I'm an American. I'm proud to be an American. I think our country is a great country. We're not perfect. We have problems. We have a uh, questionable history with some good things and bad things. Um, but I still think there's a lot to be proud of and we do a lot of good. And it's important to take pride in your country even if it's not perfect. And I do think in many regards the future for America is bright. I just don't think... America's political future is looking too bright. With that, um, that is my tier list for the U.S. presidents. Uh, are you strongly opposed to any of my opinions? Uh, do you think I'm some idiot who has no idea what he's talking about? I mean, you wouldn't be wrong. Uh, let me know in the comments below.